Even as I speak, my heart aches. Even as I look into the crowd, tears are falling in my eyes because just like the community, I feel the pain. He taught me um, what true love and true patriotism is, which is fighting for a better America for all of us. In my opinion, like uh, food is love. So I hope like I can give those food to the hospital people. Oh, weird looks, shocked looks, laughter. <laughs> Davari Armstrong, Xavier Collier, Moses Cheney Harris, and Tavian Washington, not pictured here. They're four of the most recent victims of gun violence in Denver. The four of them were killed in separate incidents from July 6th to July 11th. Advocates and local Denver leaders have been working on ways to stop the violence. We've covered these discussions all throughout this past week. But to start today's In Case You Missed It special, we want to focus on those four teenagers and their memories. Four-year-old Xavier and 15-year-old Moses were killed in a Denver apartment on the same night. The two of them were best friends, according to their families. Xavier's mother said he would have been a sophomore at Jefferson High School this fall. He loved to play football. Um, he loved family. He loved his aunties. He loved his grandma. He was just a lover. Davari Armstrong was 17 years old. He was a student athlete and a leader at the sports-based youth mentoring program, Athletics and Beyond. He's an amazing young man, first and foremost. He's a um, well-mannered. He was definitely a standout athlete, but he was an even better human being. The first teen to be killed within that five-day span was Tavion Washington. He was 19 years old. We are also continuing to remember Representative John Lewis. The civil rights leader passed away on Friday. He was 80 years old. Lewis was a freedom fighter. A freedom writer helped organize the March on Washington, was at the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday, and spent the last three decades as a Democrat from Georgia. Many black leaders in Colorado say they were inspired by Lewis, and some even got an opportunity to work with him. Nine News reporter Sonia Gutierrez spoke to some of these local leaders. We don't want you to miss how they are honoring his life and legacy. He's so inspirational. He's a man of so much uh, compassion and heart for this country. He taught me um, what true love and true patriotism is, which is fighting for a better America for all of us. Congressman John Lewis was unapologetically himself. He rightfully was characterized and described and known as the conscience of the Congress. And I consider myself really fortunate to have had the opportunity to see that up close, to see him in our caucus meetings speaking truth to power on any number of important issues. I believe I am because of who he was. I'm standing on his shoulders because he created the pathway for me to be a state senator. My name is Director Tay Anderson. I proudly serve as Colorado's youngest black elected official on the Denver School Board. I'm State Representative Leslie Harrod. I represent House District 8 right here in Denver. I'm State Senator Rhonda Fields. I represent Arapahoe County, Senate District 29 in Aurora. Joe Neguse, Congressman for Colorado's 2nd Congressional District. He must be brave, bold, and courageous. That voice will be missed. Uh, you know, the, the, the moral courage to, uh, to, to stand up and, and fight for what you believe in and, and to, he always talked a lot uh, about making sure that we found a common connection amongst each other, right? He was, he was all about love. There was a time when people like me couldn't even vote, didn't have the right to vote. The reason why we're in the streets saying Black Lives Matter is because we need to get into good trouble in order to bring the, the change and the justice we want to see for Black Americans. I think the best way to honor him is to make sure that we exercise our right to vote. We need to take his lead and continue to fight and get into good trouble. It's up to us now and, and, and to another generation of, of leaders, to the young folks uh, you know, who are organizing and pushing for change. Um, it's up to them to, to honor his memory. Now to a quick look at a growing memorial for Representative Lewis in Atlanta. It's filled with flowers and signs noting his many historical contributions. Memorial services for the congressman have not yet been announced. 
food scarcity is a big problem for families and communities all around the world. The issue has only gotten worse during this pandemic. Nine News reporter Eddie Randall shows us how the city of Aurora is teaming up with local organizations looking for a way to help. We reached out to the community and we said, what are the needs? That was the question the city of Aurora asked at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Basically what they said was, we need access to food. Claudine McDonald, community relations manager for the city, says her and her team came up with a plan. And in May, they put that plan into action. The first week we were at Aurora Central High School and we showed up, we had a thousand food kits. They found that wasn't nearly enough. They ran out of food within 30 minutes, so they went back to the drawing board. We uh, got more food, we reached out to try to find more grant money and the, through the CARES Act, and this is what we ended up with. So we're able to serve um, 500 families uh, every week. That's now 36,000 meals. Organizations and the city come together every Thursday to make this happen. The need is still very prevalent. To date, the mobile food pantry has helped nearly 15,000 people by serving over 200,000 meals. They see people coming back every week because it's something some families can't do without. A need Claudine sees and recognizes from personal experience. I can remember when, um, when you know, my family needed food, when my, um, I can remember when family came to me for food. So it's not too far gone for any of us. A humbling experience for the volunteers giving their time. It's one thing to read about the need on paper, but it's something else when you see that need right in front of your face. Me and my team, we get here at 630 in the morning just to kind of get things set up and make sure that we have the screenings and everything in order. And when you see the first car roll in shortly after you do and you don't open until 10 o'clock, that kind of tells you something. The Aurora, Aurora Mobile Pantry is a partnership between the city, interfaith services, and multiple other organizations. So bars that don't serve food aren't supposed to be open for sit-down service right now. The extended closure for a longtime dive bar in Denver means it may never reopen after nearly a century on Colfax. Some customers and former employees are now trying to save it. Maintain the same atmosphere and welcome everybody to come in. Well, all the problems that we had in the past, we there was eventually a solution to it. I don't know what the solution is with COVID. Josh Plessinger owns Knob Hill Inn at Colfax in Pennsylvania, and he's owned it since 1969, but the bar has been there even longer. It's been there 83 years. He planned to reopen on July 1st, but the day before, Governor Polis ordered bars to close again. Some of his regular customers know what Denver will lose if Knob Hill Inn closes for good, and they have started an online fundraiser to save it. Just be very heartbroken if this place was not going to be able to survive this pandemic. More than 150 people have chipped in, and so far they've raised more than $7,800. Plessinger says that should be enough to keep the bar going through the end of the year. When we talk about restaurants hit hard during the pandemic, we can sometimes overlook the really small places, the family owned restaurants without websites and social media. And if the owners aren't fluish, fluent in English, it can add one more challenge in an already tough time. Photojournalist Tom Cole shows us an organization in our community that has figured out how to help Asian restaurants and our healthcare workers. I wake up at seven, I came over here like at 7 30. So you made a hundred meals today? Yep. In my opinion, like a uh, food is love. So I hope like I can give those food to the hospital people who work in the front line. Hope you guys stay stronger. My sister and I, Tracy, started founded um, Feed Your Hospital in our Denver chapter. We just wanted to do what we can to help those mom and pop shops and those immigrant owned families that aren't very tech savvy. Thank you, thank you. We're seeing a lot of slurs being thrown around here and there, and then just attributing this entire virus to our community. And we see that a lot of restaurants have been hit hard by this, and we just want to do what we can to help. We love calories, absolutely. We contact the hospital to understand the amount of people on a given shift. Thank you so much. With when we walk through those doors and come out of the OR and see those boxes that are piled up, 
on the counters. Uh, we're, we're amazed by the generosity of the community. It's kind of something to brighten our day, look forward to, uh, fill our stomachs. Definitely helped with the morale. We do get hungry after a busy day in the OR. In Asian culture, feeding people shows that we care about them. So this is our way of showing our support. It's made us feel very fortunate, very supported. It's hard to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Colorado bike shop known for calling people to join their tribe. One local Navajo woman explains the real meaning behind that word and how it's being misinterpreted. I've been coming here since they opened. I came here about five days a week. It's more than just a place to grab a meal. An ode to the Denver restaurant so many people considered a second home. Still tracking some severe cells going across the far northeastern plains tonight. That severe thunderstorm watch until 11 o'clock. So keep that in mind. Our friends, neighbors out there, a severe thunderstorm warning now in place for parts of Logan, Morgan and Washington counties. I just looked into this cell. Of course, a lot of lightning putting on quite the show, but also uh, it is putting down quarter size hail, 60 mile per hour wind gusts. So uh, that one is going to continue to shift off to the north and east. This cell out toward Kit Carson, putting down some light rain as well well as a little bit of uh, lightning out there. Showers hit and miss if you go up to the high country overall, though cloudy skies in place. Tomorrow we're back to the upper 80s here for the metro area, low 90s in northern Colorado with 70s up in the foothills and into the mountains. Slightly cooler on Tuesday with another round of storms. And right now Wednesday hot before we bring back the lower 90s and a good chance of storms as we head toward next weekend. <music> Racines welcomed everyone to sit down at the table for a good meal, but now the restaurant on Sherman Street is closing for good. The restaurant drew many politicians and journalists into its doors over the years. There were very few occasions where people wouldn't see at least one elected official in there, and some people we spoke with say they started their day at Racines. Big decisions may have been made in there. One time walking in and seeing uh, John Hickenlooper, I think it was post-governor, having uh, breakfast with Tom Perez. They had a Democratic Party and they had a big binder uh, on the table that made it pretty clear that this was not just a get together. And that's when I thought, you know, maybe John is thinking about running for president. I think it will be a loss to the community, at least the community of people who saw this as their uh, crossroads for meetings and good food and the like. The restaurant's owners announced the decision to close on Tuesday. They had sold the land and the building for redevelopment. Racines will certainly be missed. A Golden-based bike company has used the word tribe for decades in its messaging and its marketing. But that word means something very different to one local mountain biker. Nine News reporter Katie Eastman and photojournalist Mike Grady shared her story with us this past week. Every climb is a battle. 
a reminder to Renee Hutchins that the land she rides is the land she fights for. The land is my people. It's my culture. It's our identity. And this is why connecting to the land is priceless. It's, it's why I mountain bike. The land holds her history as a Navajo woman, land that was stolen and history forgotten. We're cyclists, you know, we're lawyers, we're teachers. We're the everyday people right next to you. And so, you know, the, our fight for sovereignty is also a fight against invisibility. Her feeling of invisibility can come from a word used with good intention by non-Indigenous people. When I hear the word tribe, I... See, I'm getting emotional here, getting emotional. When I hear that, it is so be belittling and dismissive of the blood, sweat and tears that go behind our fight for sovereignty. And when she hears it in her own community, it's even tougher. Yeti Cycles has called people who buy their bikes members of their tribe. Renee wants people to know it's not your tribe. Over a thousand signatures. She created a petition to get the Golden Colorado Bike Company to stop using the word in their marketing. Change is a good thing. Today, they agreed. You know, I want to be clear that it was not ever about attacking Yeti as a company. Renee fights to make people remember. Our country in the United States has is a country that is built on the genocide of my people. This fight today is, it seems like a, a small speck in time, but this really is a battle that I was born into. A battle won on Tuesday morning. She'll climb more mountains tomorrow. I'm excited for the changes to come. I'm excited for that downhill. I can see it and we're almost there and getting gaining a lot of momentum. Katie Eastman, Nine News. In a statement released by Yeti Cycles, the company says they recently learned that the term tribe is a colonial concept that was used to marginalize Native Americans. They say while they are walking away from that word, the soul of their community remains intact. It's hard to miss this guy if you pass him on the trail. We have a conversation with perhaps Colorado's most balanced man. So have you ever seen this guy before? One of our viewers sent us this video of a Colorado man tearing down Mount Falcon. And it seemed like he might be an interesting guy to talk to if we could ever find him. And we did when a family member saw the video on Twitter. Photojournalist Chris Hansen introduces us to Gary Street, just in case you missed it. I, I like exercise and I like to do something that's fun. I don't like working out on a machine in the basement. My wife and I were walking by uh, bicycle shop 
over 30 years ago. I happened to see a unicycle in the window and I said, I wonder if I could ride one of those. And, well, the next Christmas, there was a unicycle under the Christmas tree. My friends and I ski the bumps, or at least we used to a lot. And uh, 15 years ago, I read about a ski coach that had his skiers cross-training on, on mountain unicycles in the summer. And I've been doing it ever since. Oh, weird looks, shocked looks, laughter. <laughs> You start off by just holding yourself against the wall and trying to keep yourself up on the thing. That's that's how awkward it is at first. It's a lot easier than people think. How old are you? Uh, 76. <laughs> An old fool, yeah, because I'm old and my wife's always telling me I'm a fool. I've probably had 100 stitches or so and, uh, and some chipped teeth and... Uh, Probably the worst thing was the broken rib, uh, just because they're so painful. <laughs> but uh, nothing serious. How would you say you live life? Uh, you mean, do I do a lot of stupid things? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So what did you do during the shutdown of this pandemic? Did you maybe finish a couple puzzles? Did you learn how to bake bread? Likely, you did nothing quite like this University of Colorado senior. There is nothing quite like music to bring people together. University of Colorado senior Jordan Holloway got musicians from across the world to join his virtual symphony. This is his final result, a seamless four-part symphony that he actually finished writing last year. But when his in-person concert was canceled, he found a way to bring his work to life, socially distanced, of course. His first ever symphony is titled The Patriot. The idea of a patriot is somebody who wants to see their country do the right thing, right? And so uh, the symphony kind of goes through these different ideas of, you know, just uh, appreciating the kind of natural beauty of America, uh, as well as these much more like fearful and violent images, uh, just kind of uh, inspired by the kind of tumult that we are, are currently living in. 
about 50 musicians recorded their portion of the symphony from their own homes, mostly in Colorado, but some as far away as France and Spain. And then Jordan, with the help of a friend and some very expensive equipment, synchronized all of the different recordings in order to create his masterpiece. If you would like to listen to the entire 40 minute long piece, you can find that on our website, 9news.com.